Okay, everyone, I hope everybody's doing okay. We are going to uh, learn about Eastern and Western and Venezuelan equine encephalitis today. Uh, these are what we call arboviruses, meaning that they are transmitted via mosquito bites. So arboviruses, uh, there is a series of them, um, and they generally are going to infect small rodents or birds, generally uh, wildlife and then the mosquitoes will bite those animals and then they will bite the horse or even humans and they will be transmitted like that so let me share my screen okay share here slideshow okay so eastern western and Venezuelan equine encephalitis okay so these are transmitted like i said between birds or rodents and the mosquitoes. And they are going, obviously because it's via mosquito bites, these are arboviruses, uh, they are going to be more prevalent during the mosquito season, which in Kentucky, it's going to be spring, summer, and fall. Uh, in Florida, where these diseases are a little bit, this is not equine, the Eastern is more prevalent. It is pretty much, it can, Quit. It is going. It's. It can occur um, year round in tropical zones. So, like for example, in Brazil, it can occur year round as well. So the names of these diseases. So Eastern Equine Encephalitis is their name because of the geographical area. So the Eastern got its name because it was mainly found uh, on the eastern side of the Mississippi and western in the west side of the Mississippi. They're very prevalent in North, uh, in Florida, the Carolinas, Georgia, uh, across, sometimes across the Atlantic. I'm going to uh, show you a video, a, video no, a map of where diseases are more prevalent um, here later on. Uh, but hundreds of horses um, get affected every year. Generally, these horses have a poor vaccination history um, it is very, it is less common for horses that are vaccinated to get this disease. However, they can still, but it's going to be a milder form of the disease. Uh, this disease also affects humans. So this is important. And that's also one of the most important characteristics of these diseases is that it can affect humans and it can actually kill humans. So if you do a Google search on Eastern uh, equine encephalitis or Tripoli uh, human fatalities, you're going to see multiple stories of people that died by acquiring this disease because these mosquitoes can kill, you know, can bite the horses and can also bite humans uh, and transmit um, the disease from the birds and rodents to, you know, horses and humans. Uh, I just say here that horses and humans, let me see if I can use my stylus pen. Oh, come back. Horses and humans are affected, but they do not produce high enough viremia. Meaning, for a horse, for an animal to serve as a reservoir or be the one that has the disease, that houses the disease and transmits to other animals, they have uh, to have high viremia. Viremia is when the virus is multiplying in the blood. So uh, horses that Horses and humans get sick and are considered dead end hosts, meaning they get sick, they get the disease, but they uh, don't transmit the disease to other horses, which is different. I'm going to go back here, which is different from the Venezuelan uh, virus because those, that virus actually, the horse acts as a reservoir and can contaminate and can, a mosquito can bite a horse and then bite a human and pass the disease that way. Eastern and Western, generally the mosquito will bite a bird or a rodent that is infected and then bite a horse or a human and that's how the disease uh, gets passed on. One of the things that I uh, didn't, that I neglected to uh, mention to you all when we were talking about um, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system is that, uh, remember I drew the brain, <laughs> this is a terrible drawing, the spinal cord, the nerves. Um, one of the things that I uh, neglected to mention is that, let me just, hold on, let me erase this guy here. 
eraser, eraser is that um, here, a little thinner. These are the, the nerves, uh, the brachial, the, black, the two black side. Uh, so one of the things that I neglected to mention is that to find out what kind of disease we're talking about and, with this, and to find out how neurologic disorders are diseases that affect the central nervous system, uh, which is the brain and the spinal cord, generally, okay, generally are going to affect the area that the disease is located and then backwards. This is generally how uh, nervous, you know, central nervous system diseases are, uh, they affect. So a, a disease that only affects one nerve will affect the place where that nerve is damaged towards uh, the end of whatever organ or limb that the nerve is going to innervate. So we know diseases that affect the brain, okay, we will affect the entire body. Diseases that affect the spinal cord, so if this is the disease, generally we're going to have, uh, if this is the area of the spinal cord that it's affected, it is going to affect from this point on backwards, okay, more caudally. Uh, towards the end of the horse. And that's the same, the same happens with people. So that's why we have paraplegic when the disease, when the problem in the spinal cord uh, occurs in an area cranial, okay, to the hind limbs. Or we have quadriplegic when the disease happens, uh, when the problem in the spinal cord happens uh, above the arms and then all four limbs are affected. And then if the disease happens in the brain, the entire body is affected. So this is important uh, for, for us to understand because then we can try to figure out if this disease is neurologic, if the, if the neurologic disease is central nervous system in nature, or if it is just uh, like a, a neurologic deficit to, for example, one leg or two legs and what, um, is happening okay to the horse so let's see bum, bum, i think here okay so like i said the horse for the eastern equinocephalitis the horse is considered a dead end host uh, and so is the human western equinocephalitis um, it happens still okay and uh, it is a disease that we don't find very often in horses. The reports are very sporadic, and even in humans, it's more sporadic than the Eastern equine encephalitis. The mortality rate is lower, much lower than Eastern and the Venezuelan type. It's still present in wildlife, and horses are going to serve as sentinels. What does that mean? That means that we are not testing every single wildlife out there, but when a horse gets uh, this disease, we still can know that this disease is still happening in the world. It's still happening around this area when a horse gets this disease. Like I said, though, horses to get this disease, they, the history is generally because they're not uh, vaccinated, okay? When they are vaccinated, they may get the disease, but the disease may be uh, more mild. Uh, the Venezuelan equine encephalitis is a very, very important pathogen. So we don't have this disease in this country. The Venezuelan equine encephalitis is considered an exotic disease in this country. It's also transmitted via mosquito bites, uh, but it's more, it affects Central, uh, well, I guess Mexico also, but Central America and South America very much. Uh, large outbreaks, up depending on the year, can affect horses and humans. The problem with this disease, the main, the one of the biggest problem with this disease is that humans are very susceptible to it also. And the fact that um, the human disease has never been described in the absence of horse disease, meaning horses actually serve, can serve as reservoir to transmit this disease to humans. So as opposed to the other two, when horses and humans are both dead and hosts, in the case of the Venezuelan equine encephalitis, the horse can actually transmit this disease to humans. And like I said, it, is, it has happened like in New Mexico, sometimes in Texas, 
and it's very sporadic here. And it's still, it's considered exotic in this uh, country. But the problem that we have with this disease is that because it, it is exotic and because um, we don't want horse, the population of horses here to actually get this disease, in case we find horses, when we find horses that are affected and positive for this particular virus, they get euthanized. Okay, so this is uh, an important thing for us to think about is because the horse can pass the disease to humans, horses that are affected with this disease need to be euthanized, okay? As opposed to the other two, that they can be treated, although the treatment is not very successful, especially in the case of the Eastern, okay? Um, I already said this, they serve as reservoir to spread the disease. Uh, mortality in humans is about 1%, so it's, it's kind of high, but obviously humans would try to do everything that we can. Uh, rabbits, dogs, more ruminants uh, also develop the disease. And I already said the human disease has never been demonstrated in the absence of equine disease. So what is the life cycle of this disease? So we have birds, mosquitoes, okay, primary transmission cycle. Uh, we can also have rodents here, uh, but this is what happens. They generally stay within the mosquito and birds and rodent population. And then every once in a while, humans get infected and horses get infected. Like I said, the mosquito season is spring, summer, and fall. And depending on the uh, on the location, you're going to be more or less affected annually. Uh, so this is the CDC report. So this is how many people have been um, affected with the Eastern Equine Encephali. But this ended up in 2010, and there are other um, humans that actually succumbed to the disease uh, past then. I guess I need to find another uh, source from the CDC. Uh, clinical findings. What are the clinical findings for this particular, for, for any neurologic disease that causes um, central nervous system? It's going to be that the whole animal is affected, okay? So how do we uh, diagnose one or the other? There is multiple tests that can be done, but a clinical examination is very important, okay? Uh, the Eastern and the Venezuelan are more neuroinvasive, meaning that they actually cause more damage to the neurologic system than the Western, okay? The Western, as I say here, is a little bit less lethal. Uh, the mortality rate is probably 30 to 40%, as opposed to Eastern and the Venezuelan, that is between 90 and 100% mortality rate for horses. Uh, children and young animals are more likely to develop uh, central nervous system disease than adults. What are the clinical findings of this disease? Uh, Obtunded mentation. So the horse is just not even there. So he is, um, you know, like the lights are on, but nobody's home. So even if you look inside, I mean, the horse is just listless. He's not even, you know, even though he's away, it, it's, it's actually called the sleeping sickness because the horse is trying to sleep at all times. But even though the horse is alive, he's not even aware of his uh, place in the world. Ataxia, so that is uh, the horse is just not being able to walk uh, on a straight line. He's very uncoordinated. It, it can be paralysis. Uh, stupor is when the horse is almost like comatose. He just not, is not responding to anything. Ir irregular gait, grinding of the teeth, in coordination, circling. Head pressing. Head pressing is a, si a very uh, si a sign of uh, when the brain is being affected also because uh, we assume it, there is like headache when the brain is swollen, uh, if you all can imagine. So these horses will press their heads against, you know, a post to try to possibly uh, alleviate that pain. Uh, and if, even if it isn't big to alleviate the pain, because that's what we think, uh, it is a sign of these diseases that um, cause central nervous system uh, problems. Hyperexcitability, so the horse can, you know, react in a different way than he should be reacting. Um, like I said, this one of the names of this disease is sleeping sickness, and the sleeping sickness uh, is because these horses seem to be sleeping at all times. Okay, the clinical signs are progressive in nature. Uh, meaning they start maybe a little bit with irregular gait and then within like six, seven hours, 12 hours, they go 
to more in coordination, circling, head pressing, and it progresses all the way to death, okay? If the horse is not euthanized before then. Uh, horses that are just sleeping for all day long, they're just like, they are just, you know, what we call obtained alimentation. They're just listless. They don't want to respond to anything. Here's a sign of head pressing. Here's the mosquito, okay, mosquito bite. So one of the ways to prevent this disease to us and to horses, obviously, is mosquito control. Uh, so it's something for us to think about too. When horses are uncoordinated, if they, um, depending on uh, the prognosis of this horse, if they can be taken to a hospital, they need to be put on slings because they um, are going to be thrashing, they may be circling, they may be hurting themselves, and they are going to be laying down uh, for too long. And so they need to be able to, you know, stand. So the sling and a hospital stay if the veterinarian thinks that this horse is able to recuperate is going to be paramount. So let me just try to show you here a video. Hold on, let me find this. Okay, first of all, let me share this. Okay, so here is the USDA, uh, uh, the Animal and Plant Health uh, webpage. So if you go here to Animal Health, I'm just gonna go here, Animal Health, um, you can go here to Animal Disease Information on the USDA APHIS website, and we're gonna have fish, birds, uh, cattle, blah, blah, and equine, okay? In the equine, there's going to be diseases that are, these diseases here are diseases that are reportable, meaning the state, but if the horse is positive in that particular state, they have, uh, the veterinarian needs to contact the state veterinarian, and there is surveillance for these diseases um, over here for every year, okay? So we're gonna go to the Eastern, Western Venezuela and equine encephalitis, and uh, we're, there is here a little, you know, um, fact sheet about the different things that, the, that can happen to horses. And I want you guys to actually be uh, familiar with this website because there's multiple diseases there too. But here is annual testing and case uh, summary reports. And here is the 2018 uh, case summary report. And that one has a few years. So starting here in 2005, and you can see that the trend has been going down. Uh, and we think it's because of the higher vaccination rate uh, that these diseases um, are being vaccinated against. So in about 2007, uh, the American Association of Equine Practitioners, the AAEP, have decided to put diseases into two categories, which is core vaccines and risk-based vaccines. And they included in the core, let me go back to me, they included in the core list of vaccines, tetanus, eastern and western encephalitis, rabies, and west Nile virus. So these five diseases, the AAEP, considers that every horse in the country uh, needs to be vaccinated. And then we have the risk-based vaccines, which we have flu, rhino, EVA, and then the horses that need to be vaccinated, and there's multiple others, botulism, anthrax, um, lepto, and the disease, uh, what else do we have? Um, strangles, uh, the and there's more. There's even um, snake bite or snake venom, so there is like an antidote for that. Um, so anyway, what I'm trying to say is that um, the horses for the risk base to receive those vaccines, the veterinarian needs to figure out, okay, what is the risk for this horse to get this disease, as opposed to the five core vaccines that is the same risk depending, it doesn't depend if the horse is a foe, a mare, a stud, a show horse, a race horse, because they are transmitted uh, or they are ubiquitous in the case, for example, of tetanus, they're transmitted by other animals or they're transmitted by mosquito bites, which means you know any animal, any horse can get that disease. Uh, so after that, we can see that there has been a trend down uh, for Eastern equine encephalitis. So let's see here. So this is a 2018 uh, report. You see Florida, uh, is very prevalent for Eastern. Um, 
you can see here, let me see if there is other year. So here we have the distribution map. So here we have the 2018, the 2017. So 2017, somehow Wisconsin had a ton of these diseases and Florida had only six. So it's going to depend on how the mosquitoes, or oh, Wisconsin always has more, I think maybe because of the lakes here, but then why doesn't Michigan have? Anyway, I have no idea why, uh, but you can see, so this year Wisconsin did and Michigan did, Florida had 23. It is going to depend on the mosquito uh, season in each particular state also. I am going to show here now, guys, um, videos, and I know this may be a little bit disturbing for us to watch, but it's important for us to understand how uh, central nervous system clinical signs show up. So this is what this horse is doing is circling, okay, or paddling, I mean. And he just, as you can see, he's unaware, he just does this because that's what he does. This is what circling is. So they just walk around in circles. I mean, horses generally don't just walk around in circles in their pastures, okay? So we saw paddling, we saw circling. Let's see what else. This horse here, unvaccinated. So you can see he's just like listless, has no desire to get up in that particular case. So that's already obtunded mentation, okay? Is when the horse doesn't even have any desire to get up. This is, they have to do what they have to do. So this is a little portable, I guess, emergency treatment clinic, as you can see, a little fan for the horse, okay? Because it's hot, it's Florida, it's humid. Uh, and you're trying to maintain this horse alive um, to see if he's going to survive or not. But the menace response, uh, if you touch the eye, if the horse has a strong menace response, if it, uh, it means that he's paying a little bit of attention. In this case, it doesn't have a strong menace response. That means that he, you know, is probably too far gone and difficult to be able to even save. This is um, a foe, okay? And this foe has difficulty in walking. And just so, this is a three month old foe, they say here. So this is the importance of vaccinating mares. So mares, one month prior to foaling, need to be vaccinated for many, many diseases because these foes are going to nurse the colostrum and then they can get the antibodies that way, okay? And so as you guys can see, sleeping sickness, as opposed just like trying to sleep, not wanting to uh, walk. So then she lays down, is unable to get back up. She's still trying, so she, she's not uh, you know, in stupor just yet. She's still trying and still is aware of her surroundings. But you know, and that's why I say the cases, um, the clinical signs are progressive until the animal actually dies, okay? This horse is having what looks like to be seizures, okay? The head twitching seems to be seizures. Uh, he can be very sweaty because, you know, it's hot. It's in the summer that generally these diseases are found. And... Um, so that's why comfort of the horse is also important, okay? So we are lucky that we have uh, the clinics here in Lexington uh, that can actually take these horses in and give a more um, dedicated team just for their horse and um, around the clock 24 seven, as opposed to in rural, more rural areas of the veterinary goes there, gives like a bag of fluid to the horse and hopes for the best, okay? Uh, like I said, unvaccinated horses most likely are going to need to be euthanized. Uh, let me go back to our PowerPoint. Let's see. Go back. Okay. The definitive diagnosis in the antemortem, so the, before the horse dies, may not be possible. Uh, serology may be indicative, especially if uh, the horse hasn't been vaccinated and he has some antibodies against that disease. 
So it may be indicative, um, but the horse doesn't live very long to be um, to form a lot of antibodies against it. Okay, so it's generally you're going to do the diagnosis post mortem with um, with you know other tissues also of the horse. So here, rise antibody titers in horse that survived, meaning it takes time for the horse to uh, mount up an antibody response. Um, so for the horses that will die or be euthanized, it's not enough time. Uh, we need to uh, differentiate between rabies, uh, hepatic encephalopathy, PM West Nile, and equine herpes virus type 1. This I have here in red is, and I want you guys to put a star beside this, because it is paramount to obtain definitive diagnosis of encephalitis in the horse. And if we were in class, I would actually ask you to give uh, some ideas why. But the idea why is because certain diseases can actually affect humans as well, okay? And because it can affect humans and horses serve as sentinel, we need to be able to, um, oh, and I guess Hope just showed up here. Hope, Hope I'm recording the class. Uh, so you're welcome to stay here or you can leave if you want, but I'm recording the next set of slides that are gonna go up. Um, so the reason why it's paramount to obtain is because it can also be, um, humans can get affected and therefore it's important that we know what exactly killed the horse, such as if it's rabies because humans that got in contact with the horse, they need to be able to be treated or vaccinated. Uh, treatment and prevention. So there is no particular treatment for these diseases. Okay, the treatment is going to be, you know, support, meaning IV fluids, uh, catheter, um, you know, urethrocatheter for these horses, uh, steroids, heavy, like a large dose of steroids to try to decrease the inflammation in the brain and uh, spinal cord. Uh, to try to decrease the, the, the clinical signs of this disease. Obviously, tranquilizers for these horses because if they are pedaling, if they're thrashing, if they are, unaware, you know, if they are unaware of their surroundings and are going to hurt themselves, uh, they are going to probably need to be tranquilized. Diuretics because uh, to try to, again, decrease the swelling of the brain and the spinal cord because of inflammation, they become... Um, very swollen. To prevent, so prevention is the most important uh, measure for these diseases. So we're going to have to do vaccination. Like I said, the AAP uh, says that every single horse needs to be vaccinated for these diseases. Mosquito control, that's important. So we uh, can use um, uh, any type of mosquito control. So no standing water, uh, especially in the, it's hard in Kentucky because it seems to rain all the time. Uh, but we can put, you know, mosquito sprays on these horses. Uh, sprays that are going to repel the mosquitoes need to be heavy on the permethrin, um, you know, uh, particular ingredient. And some of those natural sprays, you know, they may repel for about half an hour uh, to an hour, but all these sprays get degraded uh, in sunlight. So it becomes a little bit of a problem. Another way to prevent mosquito bites in the horse is to put mosquito sheets, keep these horses in the shade, keep these horses inside stalls with fans. The fans are going to need to blow hard. So the, the idea for fans is not only to keep the horse comfortable when it's hot in the summer, but also to prevent mosquitoes to land on the horse to actually bite. So the fan needs to be on a high enough uh, air movement, okay? in a high enough setting so the, to actually prevent these mosquitoes from actually setting on the horse to bite these horses. Um, aerial spray of insecticides. So some states like Maryland, they, uh, because they have a lot of uh, lakes, the same with Kentucky. I don't know if we use a lot of uh, aerial spraying, but I know that Maryland does of uh, bodies of water to try to kill all these mosquitoes. All these mosquitoes, uh, their life cycle depends on water. They lay eggs in the water, and then it takes about five to seven days for these eggs to eclode and form new mosquitoes. So we can't, standing water is our enemy. So anybody that has anything outside that is standing water, such as water troughs that don't get cleaned and dumped at least once a week, uh, tires, vases, any kind of compartment that, um, 
can maintain, you know, rainwater uh, is a problem. Uh, spray horse with permethrin based products. We already talked about the Venezuelan equine encephalitis. It's just a matter of is this disease ever going to be um, here in this country to stay? It hasn't yet, but as we have been seeing, it is actually very possible that the mosquitoes can uh, adapt and start to pass this disease here. The, the disease can, you know, become prevalent here as well. Uh, this is the USDA APHIS. APHIS um, website that I want you guys to see. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me, to contact me so we can, uh, so I can try to answer to you. Thank you. I was going to end this lecture, but now I decided not to because one other thing that we, that is very similar to this particular disease, the Eastern, the Western, and the, hold on, clear, clear all drums. And Eastern and Western uh, and the Venezuelan equine encephalitis, and especially because we're talking about the Venezuelan equine encephalitis, is West Nile virus. The West Nile virus disease was a disease that was foreign to this country up until 1999. In 1999, if you guys remember Dr. Tim when you're talking about this, there were some birds that were found dead, I guess in, uh, in New York, New York State, and they, you know, there was a zoologist that said, oh my gosh, so many birds are dying, what's going on? Uh, and it was the West Nile virus that had made its way to this country and, you know, uh, officials had said, okay, the, the, the virus is not going to survive. The vector is going to die. Uh, they can survive the harsh winter of this country. And this is not what happened. What happened is that year after year, uh, it just became much more prevalent. And now it's spread all over the United States. So West Nile virus is also part of uh, a neuro, you know, the neurologic group of diseases. Let me stop sharing. Uh, the neurologic group of diseases, and uh, it is also central nervous system that it affects, and it is part of the core vaccination as well. And the West, it's very likely uh, to have the same kind of um, clinical signs. The, the mortality rate for West Nile virus is probably around 50%, so it's not as severe as the Eastern uh, in Venezuela, equine encephalitis but uh, it's still deadly. And the uh, uh, West Nile virus, for some reason, we have a peak and it goes, uh, it becomes more prevalent or the incidence actually happens uh, more around September and October. So more fall than spring and summer. Now, because these diseases uh, are mosquito borne, we generally booster, and this is a one, it's an annual vaccination for horses everywhere, but like in Florida, they do twice a year vaccination because they are always, um, it's always prevalent in the state. It doesn't have just the, you know, less prevalent in the winter, for example, because it's always warm in Florida. So in Florida, the recommendation is that horses are vaccinated for Eastern equine encephalitis twice a year. In the rest of the country, it's once a year. Uh, but because these are mosquito-borne diseases, and we know that it happens in the spring, so this, for people that vaccinate horses twice a year for different kinds of diseases, this is a disease that needs to be boosted. When do we think? In the spring. So March is the time to vaccinate these horses for any mosquito-borne diseases, okay? And uh, uh, so they mount up and have a higher immune system, higher levels of circulating antibodies in April, May, June, July, because remember the antibodies are going to decay uh, with time, okay? So it's important that we booster these diseases in the spring. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is that there is a vaccine now uh, by Zoetis that has the five uh, core vaccines for these horses, okay? Uh, it used to be that rabies was separate, uh, but now Zoetis uh, made a vaccine and all five of these diseases are present. Uh, what else did I want to say? Let me think about this here in a second and I'll come back with you in a second. Okay, so what I wanted to say, let me share the screen here. Let me go to this and back to the APHIS website. 
And here you can see West Nile virus also and how um, it passes on to the same thing that happens to uh, with Eastern and Western encephalitis that birds are the reservoir for this disease. Uh, mosquitoes are going to generally just stay within the birds, but uh, the horse and humans are accidental hosts at the end. The virus was introduced in 1999. Since then, 27,000 horses have been infected. Um, treatment, like I said, there really is no treatment other than supportive care. Prognosis is going to be poor for horses with severe neurologic signs and mortality rate is about 35%. Uh, distribution maps, this is what I wanted to show. So here is 2018, as you can see, Kentucky had 17 cases, Montana had 50 cases, and Pennsylvania, 112 cases. I don't know why some years, some states, you know, states that we would maybe think that did not have a lot of mosquitoes uh, have high uh, prevalence, okay? So as you can see, it affects the entire country depending on the year, okay? Um, what else did I wanna say here? Let me see what else we have. This is the, like I said, the APHIS USDA report. So this is how many, so this is in all the states in all, what counties we had. So we had in Boyle County and in Powell County in 2009 in Kentucky. So like I said, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, and if you want to join in when you see that I'm recording, you're welcome to also, and we can uh, have a chat then. Okay. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.